how, how would that come about? How would you sit down and write a film like this? And Jack goes, well, I was smoking a lot of weed back then. <laughs> <laughs> Of the city, they shine in my spotlight. Commissioner on the rooftop, double H in the night sky. For the sidekicks, we fight. For the right crosses, we throw. For the ninjas, we injure revenge on our foes. From crime alleys to radioactive insects, genetic mutations. Weapon X rejects our infinite arson and crisis. Our walls are civil but secret. Here come Buddy, Manny, and Aaron blaring through your speakers. Yeah, totally heroes. It's clobbering time. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm honored. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're really happy and excited to talk to you. Thank you. So you, you have so much experience in, in the industry, and it's Thank just going to be a lot of fun to hear all the cool stories. Thank you. Yeah, I have a lot of memories, yes. which I'm very um, fortunate to have. And I always say, you know, when I, I do these panels, I love reminiscing. And I always think, you know, back in the days when they used to have vaudeville, sometimes they get the hook and they pull people off. So yeah. if I start <laughs> rambling on too long, or <laughs> no, don't worry. Just if, get me if off. you're rambling, you're doing our job for us. So <laughs> we appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> um, it's going to be your birthday soon, huh? Yes. Yeah. In, a, in about a month. About. Yeah. Happy early birthday. Well, yes. thank you. Yeah, I was born on Thanksgiving Day, and oh, it oh. falls different, you know, every yeah. year. But when I was born, it was on Thanksgiving. Well, but so thank you. Be that was very thankful for, I guess. Thank you. <laughs> So you've been in the business for quite a while, and yeah. um, some of the biggest things we know you from is uh, Star, Trek Star Trek and Old Yeller, and there's so much more in here. Uh, so let's cut, let's kind of get into it here. Okay. Um, at six years old, you were in the the film The Killer That Stalked New York, right? Yeah, that was the first film I ever did. It was with Evelyn Keys and William Bishop and Dorothy Malone, and um, I played a little girl that. Um, I'm in the doctor's office, and Evelyn Keys is a carrier of smallpox, and everybody she comes in contact with um, gets smallpox and dies, and so she doesn't know she's a carrier, so she's actually the killer, but not knowing, and so um, in this scene, she's wearing this beautiful brooch, and I admire it, and she takes it off and gives it to me, and then I give her a hug to thank her, and in doing so, I get smallpox. So oh, then yeah. it goes to the next scene where I'm laying in the hospital bed with the oxygen tent and everything. So I died in my first film. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you were six years old. How did, how did you get started? Um, did, you, did you know at that age you wanted to be an, an actress? Or? Well, you know, I was so young. But actually, I started modeling children's clothes when I was four. And um, I had an agent, and I would go around on countless auditions, but I didn't have any experience. The only thing I'd ever done was model children's clothes. So um, my older sister, Audrey, was an acrobat, and she used to perform at various shows. And so this one time, we were in Long Beach, California, at the Veterans Hospital. And my sister was performing, and so they had me get up on stage and sing. And I was, I guess, six at the time. And Jock Mahoney happened to be there. And people will remember him from The Range Rider and Yancey Derringer. And he was this big cowboy and um, really handsome man. And so I, I saw him. And you know, I was like six years old and very tiny. And he's this big, handsome cowboy. And so I was mesmerized by him. And so we talked and everything. And then a couple months later, I was on another audition. And as fate would have it, I guess he happened to walk through the lobby. And he remembered me. And he asked my mother what I was doing there. And she said, well, you know, she's reading for the part um, of Walda Kowalski. And I know she's not really right for the part. Because in the script, it said sitting there in the doctor's office is little Walda Kowalski with her big brown eyes and her long brown hair. Well, I was blue-eyed and blonde. And, you know, not that that was really relevant to the storyline, but sometimes, you know, writers will get in their mind kind of what, you know, who They're they envision. Yeah, they want yeah, to so we didn't, that vision. Yeah. yeah, we didn't really think I was right for it. So Jock Mahoney was under contract at the time, and he had some clout. So he said, I'll be right back. 
So he left, and what we found out later is he went into the producer and director and he go, oh, this kid, she's done this and she's done, I hadn't done a thing. <laughs> and so Make basically, yeah, yeah, he lied <laughs> and um, they took his word for it. And so he um, basically, you know, I owe it to him, he got me started because they took a chance on me and it was all because of him. And so after I had that first movie, um, it was easier from there because I could say that I had done a movie with dialogue. So after that, I did Here Comes the Groom with Bing Crosby and Jane Wyman and uh, Fran Chatone and Louis Armstrong and Dorothy L'Amour. It was, and I played a French war orphan, and that was at Paramount. So then they uh, cast me in Shane, the Alan Ladd yes. movie. I was one of the Lewis children. And then I did the greatest show on earth there with um, Jimmy Stewart. I was the little girl in the audience uh, where Jimmy Stewart is dressed up as a clown and he comes and talks to me and gives me a balloon and that. And then I did Superman and the Mole Man oh, yeah. with George Reeves. And then I did Hans Christian Andersen with Danny Kay. I was the little girl outside the jail where he sings Thumbelina. And so I just kind of segued from there and then I did The Juggler with um, Kirk Douglas. Okay. And um, so that's kind of, and then I did a movie, it never did much. It was called Aaron Slick from Pumpkin Creek and it was with Alan Young and Dinah Shore and that was also at Paramount. So that's kind of how it happened and then TV was starting to come into play. Right. So then it kind of segued into. into television. So as a, as a <coughs> six year old girl, um, on a movie set, uh, did they do special things for uh, for a child actress, or did you did they kind of treat you like the rest of the actors around? Did they? Well, um, as a child, as a minor, they have specific rules, mm -hmm. um, you know, for children, which you know, thank goodness they do, because when um, they first started doing movies, you know, back in the twenties and thirties and all that, they didn't have any child labor laws. So um, to segue a little bit. Um, Recently, I, I uh, narrated a documentary on child stars, and um, it's called Growing Up with Hollywood. And baby Peggy, uh, she was like the first child star from like the 30s. And so everybody was interviewed, and I narrated it. And it was so <laughs> sad, and, and you know, to see her talk about her childhood when she was four years old, they were having her do her own stunts and um, her family spent all her money and um, you know they had her working like 14 15 hours a day at four years old it was wow. she said it was horrible you know and so then later Jackie Coogan they have it's called the Jackie Coogan law um, they put into effect all these rules you know for children so you have to have three hours of schooling a day on the set and they're called welfare workers and they call them that because they're they're basically for the welfare of the child to make sure you can't work overtime. You have to have an hour for lunch. You have to have three hours of schooling. You have to have breaks and, and stuff like that. So um, I was doing an episode of Wagon Train with Lou Costello from Abbott and Costello, and he it was the only dramatic role he ever did, and he was wonderful. It was it was really fun to work with him, and Ward Bond was um, the wagon master on that show. Well, Ward Vaughn, he was a wonderful man, but he was used to being around a lot of guys, so he had a really foul mouth, and he didn't <laughs> mean to, but it would just come out, you know? And I was a minor, I was like 12, I think, 11 or 12 at the time. And so the welfare worker there went up to the director, and she said, if he uses one more swear word, I'm pulling her from the set. And she had that authority that she could do that. So, and he, he didn't mean to swear. It was just, you know, he's used to a bunch of guys. And so, and I didn't even know what he was saying because I was too young to know what those words were. But, um, but anyway, she made him stop. So he came over and he apologized profusely that he wouldn't, and after that, he never even said darn, you know, he was saying. <laughs> so, um, so they do, you know, they, they treat you, um, very well and they take good care of you and you know they have all their little rules and stuff so it was fun oh, that's cool um you were like you just said you were um, you were part of uh some of the first superman that was on television right yeah i worked it, it was called superman and the mole man yes. it was a two-parter and i was the little girl that's um 
in bed and then the little mole men climb in through the the window and we start playing ball and it lights up and and everything and you know I was very young at the time I think I was like seven and of course I didn't know who George Reeves was and um but I did know who Superman was and he was not in the particular scene that I was in but he was on the set in a Superman costume so for me it was just a thrill because I thought you know that I was working with Superman and um, and then ironically a couple months later I was cast in a TV show and it was called Heart of Gold and it was with Edmund Gwynn and George Reeves played the father and Tommy Reddick and I played brother and sister he later was the boy on the TV show Lassie well he was you know just dressed like a regular person of course because he's the father and so some of the crew uh, on just to kind of tease him and everything would refer to him as Superman well I couldn't quite comprehend like I didn't get it like why are they calling him Superman so I asked my mother and um, I guess she didn't want to burst my bubble because I said why how could he be Superman so she said well he really is Superman but he's just play acting to be your father's so I was like, I was like, I was so excited to think that you know he really was Superman. I mean, I never claimed to be a bright child, I, I just, but that was the exciting part for me. And you know, um, I was so blessed as a child because I was directed by George Stevens and uh, Stanley Kramer and Frank Capra and Cecil B. DeMille. But when you're seven or eight years old, you have no concept of that I had no idea and it wasn't until I became an adult you know and look back over my career and I thought I was truly blessed to have the opportunity to, you know to work with those people and um, so many wonderful people you know Jack Benny and Loretta Young Kirk Douglas and you know all those people and I'm just very fortunate that sounds awesome oh thank you with the uh, you being a part of Superman early on and the evolution of, of these superheroes nowadays they've come become so, something so much bigger I mean we've got these cons going on um, yeah. how, how do you feel about that how do you I feel think about it's seeing? wonderful you know to keep it going and you know um, I just you know like there's Lone Ranger fans you yes. know because it's a different world today as we all know you know right. like when I was a child you know kids would go outside and play and and all that and now you know the world is Full of technology which is not a bad thing I mean it's it's wonderful but um, I just think it's nice to have superheroes and people to look up to and to right. emulate and all that so I think it's wonderful and this is my first time here and I was quite um, pleased when they invited me I was very honored and I thank all of you too for being here to listen yeah. to my memories now we were excited to hear that we were going to interview you so thank that was you. so awesome um, how do you feel about how Superman's being portrayed nowadays? And you, you, have, have you had a chance to watch any of the new movies? Um, a couple of them, yeah. yeah. You, yeah. You it, well, you know, it's different, it's, it's but different, you know, yeah. the world changes, and I guess you have to go with different the Different topics they battle. It's yeah. different, yeah. yeah. But, you know, the old TV shows that I did, because they did, you know, like Leave it to Beaver and Father Knows Best and... Um, those kind of shows and now they have all the nostalgia TV stations you know like Antenna right. and MeTV and all that and it's fun to watch them but it's just so different from the shows of today you know like you see June Cleaver with her pearls and you know and, and the husbands always are wearing a tie at home and stuff like that you know it's different right. but different it's, it's, it's fun yeah and I still get a few residuals and I got one last about two weeks ago and it was for one penny seriously I, I, I'm not kidding I've gotten some small ones because you know the older the show the more they they rerun them and then it evolves until it there's nothing left and I've gotten some you know for four dollars and six dollars and eight dollars and things like that I, n I had to look at it twice it literally was for one penny and I'm thinking sounds, seriously sounds like it would probably cost you more I to know. send you the check I know and the, and so yeah. the gross amount was three cents and then the net, <laughs> <laughs> the net honest to, I, I'm not kidding I had to look at it twice because I actually had this check for one penny isn't that hilarious and I think who keeps track of that I don't know how they I was going to say imagine going to the bank you're like 
I know. We got this. Yeah. Like, I need to cash this. Right. <laughs> yeah. well, you know, what then, am I going to do with it? I know. Yeah. It's just so fun. I, th I have a theory, and I think because there's a lot of actors that get these small residuals, you mm -hmm. know, and it's one thing to get a, a residual for like $20, but when you get something like a penny or eight cents or three dollars or whatever I think they should not give it to us and keep track so we know that I would we would have them but put it back into the motion picture fund because there's oh, yeah. a lot of people you know as they get older and people think that a lot of you know actors have a lot of money and some of them of course do and it's different you know when I was working you know the average you know show I'd make two hundred and fifty dollars a week now kids make a million dollars, you know? I mean, it's all relative because things were a lot cheaper, but but by the standards, I mean, it's it's crazy. So there's a lot of actors that once they get, you know, done with a series or whatever, it's hard for them to segue into something else because they're... Um, typecast? Kind of typecast, yeah. you know, like Jay North, for instance, who was Dennis the Menace. And, um, you know... So a lot of people struggle as actors, and that's all they know how to do because that's all we've ever done or whatever. And so um, they have the motion picture home and to take care of, you know, the older actors that no longer can work and they're ill. So I think they should put those small residuals back into the motion picture fund. Yeah, Do you think that would make idea. more sense? Yeah, yeah definitely. But, uh, but you mentioned Lone Ranger. <coughs> yeah. Yes, that's one of the most well-known uh, uh, westerns out there. It, do you kind of consider that your breakout role? And if not, is was there a, one um, that you did consider? Well, it was one of my favorite films. I think old people know me more from Old Yeller, but yes. um, The Lone Ranger, it was the feature film with um, Clayton Moore and Jay Silverheels. And we um, filmed the majority of it in Kanab, Utah. And um, this was, you know, back in the 50s. And I run, it's funny because I'm a huge animal lover. It's like, that's my thing, my passion, because animals have no voice. We are their voice. So I love doing these shows and selling pictures and books and whatever because I like to donate to the animal charities. And there's a, a huge animal um, place called Best Friends in Kanab, Utah. And it's one of the charities that I support. And Ironically, it's built on the very spot that we filmed The Lone Ranger. And in the movie, I get kidnapped by the Indians, and then I guess who comes to the <laughs> rescue? <laughs> and so um, it, it was a lot of fun, and we, um, we were there for like three months in Kanab, Utah. And Clayton Moore had it in his contract that he was not allowed to be photographed without his mask on. Wow. And so, and I talk about this in my book. I, ha I have my book at my table. It's my autobiography. And um, it, was, it was very comical because we, were, we had a day off, so we were all, you know, out at the pool. And so um, Clayton Moore was there swimming and everything, and a fan recognized him. So she came up to him and asked if she could, you know, have her picture taken with him. So we said, sure, hold on one second. And he had to get his mask, and he came over. And it was just the funniest sight to see this man in, like, bathing trunks and a mask. It was just, like, really weird. But he was not allowed to be photographed without it on. So oh, I remember that. It was fun. Have you had a chance to see the new one yet? No. No? No, not yet. Well, I, I think Am Army Hammer is a pretty good uh, He's a pretty yeah. good actor. He's got a lot of potential. Yeah, he's, he's a gonna, good actor. He's going to get far. Um, yeah, uh, so, um, of, of course, we've talked about Old Yeller, um, the infamous scene. Um, oh, when they shoot him. Yeah, how did, that, how did that go for you? How was that as a <laughs> Well, it was a tearjerker. I mean, I've had, like, grown men come up and go, I can't watch that movie, it's too sad, you know? But um, that dog was a fabulous dog. He, his real name was Spike, and they got him out of an animal shelter. They rescued him. And, um, you know... The other shows like Rin Tin Tin and Lassie, that they had several collies and several German Shepherds, and depending on whatever the dog needed to do, they would pick whichever one did it the best because they all looked exactly alike. Well, because Old Yeller, you know, he, he was a rescue dog. They only had one of him. So um, he did everything, and he was such a smart dog. 
and it was so much fun. And so when I was filming Old Yeller, it was the time of the Mickey Mouse Club. Mm -hmm. So I had school, we had school in a big red trailer on the Disney lot. So I got to, you know, go to school with all the, the Mouseketeers, Annette, who was the sweetest person in the world, and all the Mouseketeers. And to this day, Sharon, who's one of the original Mouseketeers, is one of my very best friends. We've known each other for like 60 years. And she lives in Reno, and I live in Las Vegas, but we try to get together a couple times a year, and we talk almost every day. So um, it was a wonderful experience. And um, I, I'll share one funny story. Um, Tommy, have any of you seen Old Yeller? Have you yes. ever seen? Oh, yeah. yeah, yay. <laughs> <laughs> and Tommy Kirk, the one who played Travis, um, he also lives in Las Vegas where I do. And we're still friends. After 60 years, we get together periodically and have dinner. And um, we were doing a show a, um, a while back, and we were sitting at this table, and we had our Old Yeller photos, and this lady came up to us, and she looked at the pictures, and looked at us and looked again and she said, I can't believe this, that I'm meeting you both. Old Yeller was one of my favorite movies. I must have seen it 20 times. And it's so amazing to me that you're both still alive. Oh, wow. <laughs> what a compliment. <laughs> I know. I guess it was I hilarious. Did. I know. That's hilarious. Yeah. I know. So. One thing that stood out to me while I was watching the movie is, um, you know, movies are made differently nowadays with so many rules and policies, procedures, mm -hmm. and uh, one thing that stood out to me while I watched Old Yeller was uh, the some of the fight scenes that the dog had to go they through. They looked spot. real, didn't they? Yeah, it fought a bear, fought a wolf. I um, know. It's, so I know. Did, did, how did they do that? Did, I, I, you know, they're, they're just well trained, or did they really yeah, get those? Yeah, no, they didn't really. I mean, they they always have somebody there from the Humane Society to make sure that no, you so know, they did you'll notice in well. movies yeah. afterward it'll say no dogs were harmed or whatever, and, right, and they were very you know, and they were trained by the Weatherwax family. And there's a new book out called uh, Four Feet to Fame, and it's about the Weatherwax family that trained, you know, pretty much trained all the dogs back in the day. And I wrote the foreword for it. I was honored they asked me to write the foreword um, because of, you know, having worked on Old Yeller. But um, yeah, that was one of my favorite memories. And, um, you know, we worked on it for three months. and. Sadly, Tommy, Kirk, and I are the only two still alive from that movie, speaking of that. Because um, there were only seven of us in the whole film. There were no you know, other actors, no extras or anything. It was just seven of us. It was Chuck Connors and um, Fess Parker, uh, Jeff York, Dorothy McGuire, Tommy Kirk, Kevin Corkin, and myself. And Kevin, sadly, the, who played the younger boy, Arliss, he passed away about two years ago from cancer. That's Very bad. sad, yeah. So that's why, you know, every day is a gift, and we have Definitely. to just, all of us, be grateful for each day. That's great. Um, I, uh, <coughs> I noticed that, uh, so before Old Yeller, Disney was doing, the majority of their movies were animated movies, and Old Yeller kind of hel helped them get in more into live action films. Yeah. Right, and it's um, how, how did how was it back then? Uh, you know, I don't know how that actually came about, but it was um, it was from what I've been told is that even to this day, Old Yeller stands up as one of the all time classic films, it's which is one of the only if one of the only movies, if not the only movie on Rotten Tomatoes that has one hundred percent on it. Really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's I, I thought that was interesting. Well. Yeah. Yeah, because I was going to ask, did you ever think it was going to be as iconic? No. I mean, it's you, you such never a do, staple. Right? You know? had no idea. No, same with, you know, Star Trek, because when I was cast in Star Trek, it was the second season, and it wasn't all that popular, and I had no idea that, you know, 50 years later, it's still, you know, popular, and people embrace it, and it's still around, and there's Star Trek fans everywhere. It's amazing. I, you mentioned that you moved from from the film to television. Mm -hmm. um, how, what what caused you to do that? Was that was that a conscious effort, or well, did just, you just kind of um, just, just the opportunities? Just the opportunities. You know, my now. agent would send me on you know auditions for various TV shows, and I did a couple radio shows as well. But radio was kind of dying out, you know. And uh, one of my first TV shows I did was with Jack Benny. 
and it was back in the days of live TV. So um, it was very, it was a very, it's on YouTube. Um, I'm planted in the audience and during his monologue, I come up and ask for his autograph and then it turns out my name is Margaret Truman and we do this whole bit on that. And I was very fortunate because I, um, Jack Benny and I stayed in touch up until the time he died and he used me several times on various shows and we did an act that we traveled all over the East Coast and we played Vegas and Tahoe and um, I, I write about that also in my book about the experiences with him because he always played the stingy tightwad and he was probably one of the most generous people that I've ever known just just a wonderful man uh, you were you were in Gidget Gidget, yeah, we with Sally, Sally Field. Field. How was that? Darling, just a, Is I she did the, the nice person that we all absolutely expected adorable. Yeah, and um, I did, I guess, two or three episodes of Gidget, and then I worked with Patty Duke, and um, she was wonderful. Just yeah, that was very sad when she passed away. Um, we, uh, you had your your time on Star Trek, um, your episode. How was that? You. It was really fun. Um, I had no idea at the time that, you know, 50 years later it would be so popular. And when I went on the audition, <clears throat> the first thing they asked me was if I was claustrophobic. And I, I thought that was an odd question <laughs> to ask me. But the reason is because I don't know if any of you have seen that episode, The Deadly Years. Have you seen it? it um, I die from old age. Yes. And so they had to put me in makeup. And in order to make me look that old, I, I had to be, um, they had to put a plaster cast on my face. And I had to breathe through a straw for four hours while it dried. Oh, four hours. And then they took the plaster cast, and from that they did a rubber mask. And then so makeup, you know, it went on forever, you know, because um, they had to put the wig and then they did the, you know, the mask and, and all that. So the reason they asked me if I was claustrophobic is because not everybody would be able to stand that plaster cast on their face, I guess. So I never knew if I got the part because I wasn't claustrophobic or because I read okay, I don't know. But somebody said to me, how long did it take you to do that makeup? And I said, about the same time as it takes me now. It's like, <laughs> it's like it was a, um, but it was, and then at the end of the day, it took like an hour and a half to take it off because back then, you know, they put it on with spirit gum. So they'd like oh, pull wow. it off and it hurt. But oh, now they've come gosh. a long way with yeah. makeup and special effects and everything. You got to wear the uniform. I awesome. know, but I was wearing, uh, I wasn't even wearing red and I died. Yeah. And that was yeah. like, <laughs> I was like, that was not fair. But um, yeah, the, the Star Trek fans are amazing because I've done some Star Trek conventions and they come up and they know every episode and every character and they even know your dialogue. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's amazing to me. They're so loyal. You it's died wonderful. in Shat Shatner's arms? I did, so it wasn't was a total that? loss. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you get to spend time with some of the actors? Well, you know, during... uh, uh, when you do a feature film, it's much more laid back, and, you know, you work there three or four months, and you it sounds corny, but you do become kind of a family because you see each other every day. But with the TV shows, you know, they're done really quickly. Like, they do whole episode in one week so and I think I worked on that show like three days and you know so I mean the, the days are long because we were in makeup for like four hours and and then you know another hour and a half to take it off after so it's a long you know 14 hour day but um, so I, I got to know them and they were all very very welcoming to me which was nice and um, but we didn't you know there's really not time you don't hang out with them per right. se work yeah not like, um you uh how was it uh, you got to get beamed up right yeah uh, how was that how was that experience like how do, what do you have to go through when they're well you don't really see that's all special right. effects exactly. afterwards they so you they just tell time. you to stand still and uh -huh. then they do that whole thing that comes up later so but nowadays i mean the special effects they have now are, i mean they're incredible because um back then it was pretty good, I think, for considering it was 50 years ago. But um, like, I did an episode of Thriller, and um, I played this girl that was 
you know, locked up in a in the attic, and then Pippa Scott is driving, and um, of course they had to be raining. Do you ever notice that in every horror film, it's always raining? I don't know why they. Yeah. And so she, her car breaks down, and she comes in. It's like a haunted house, and Jeanette Nolan, who um, she played the grandmother who was a witch. And she was a brilliant actress, just a wonderful lady. So she causes horrible things to happen to me. And so there's this one scene where Pippa Scott is going through the house and she finds me hiding in the attic. So we go down to have dinner. Well, what is supposed to happen is while we're you know, sitting at the, d the dining table, all of a sudden I scream and I put my hand up to my cheek and I pull it down and there's claw marks with blood and it's what the grandmother had caused. So the way they did that is interesting because it was in black and white, it was back in the 50s. So um, they took some kind of, it was like a putty, like skin colored, and they patted it on my face and, um, no, I take that back, it was on my hand. Um, that was a different scene. <laughs> um, so they put a sponge and they glued it to my hand and they cut three ridges down the um, sponge and then they took, literally, I'm not making it, Hershey's chocolate syrup, and they put it down the ridges because it was black and white. So chocolate syrup, you know, oh, would photograph okay. his yeah. blood. So I have my hand like this, and the sponge is in my palm of my hand with the ridges with the Hershey's syrup on it. And then on cue, I lift my hand up like I'm screaming, and when I pull it away, the, it looked like claw marks. That was Hershey's chocolate. That's so, interesting. That's how they did that. And then all of a sudden, um, this mug, this like tin cup, comes and it starts going up and then it starts banging me on the head. And this right. is supposed to be what she's, you know, has caused. And I start screaming and run off. So what they did was they had the prop man, they took um, fishing line and they tied it to the, you know, the handle of the tin thing. And he's on a ladder. And so, and then he had like a pole with this, it was like, a, it was weird. And then on cue, as he's standing off the, you know, the side of the camera and he picks it up, he starts banging me on the head. And he got paid to do that. <laughs> it was like, and so they, but you could kind of see, you know, if you look closely, you could kind of see the fishing line and the, but yeah. you know, yeah. that was, you know, hundred years ago so they've, <laughs> <laughs> they've come a long way with special effects but that's how they did it then um, how do you feel about uh, your bloopers being out on the internet oh my god <laughs> <laughs> on Star Trek yeah. yeah well you know as an actor you try to come prepared and you try to know your lines and all that but it was such a loose set and people had so much fun and people were joking around all the right. time and so um, I had no idea they were even doing a blooper reel so when I ended up on the booper reel, it was funny, but at a lot of the Star Trek conventions, people come up, and that's the thing they remember, the you bloopers, were on the booper yeah. reel. So it was fun, it was all done and fun. Did you get to keep anything from Star Trek? No, no. they don't let you no. really do that. I heard, a, I was listening to a podcast one time where uh, Patrick Stewart said that he had, to, he had to take something from the set, they wouldn't give it to him. Yeah. So he had to find his way to get something <laughs> off set. Yeah, they're real strict about yeah, that stuff. Yeah, they are. <laughs> Um, you know, we, we are a podcast, Hardly Heroes, and uh, we like to uh, ask our guests um, a, a certain questions, and, and you being one of our guests, uh, we'd like to ask you if there's any uh, superhero that you favor. Is it, is it you have a favorite superhero out there? Well, um, I, I guess I'm a little biased. I'd probably have to say the Lone Ranger. Okay, no, that's Superman. great. That's a good one. No. That's awesome. Okay. Uh, if you had a superpower of your own, if any superpower or ability, what would it be? To see that um, all the homeless animals get a home. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Good job. I think that's the first time we've actually heard somebody say that type of ability. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's usually like flying or no, reading. No, no, that's or, so nice. Yeah. She's like, no, no, I want to take care of all the animals. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> Um, okay, well, at this point, we could, uh, you guys are, feel free to ask questions. Does anybody yeah, have a yeah. question to ask Beverly? Don't be shy. No, anyone? Anybody? Nope. Go ahead. When you were on the Star Trek set, was that a complete change from, you know, what you'd been doing before? You know, like yeah, it was different, you know, because I hadn't really, well, I did um, science fiction theater, 
and that was kind of sci-fi and I did one step beyond but um, going into Star Trek that was a new thing for me and it was exciting and um, you know the costumes and the whole ambiance and everything it was fun and as I mentioned I, I really had no idea that it would go you know on all these years later to be so iconic because um, as I said, it wasn't even that popular in the beginning. It became more popular after it went off the air and then the fans brought it back and then it went into syndication. And um, So I feel very fortunate. I mean, I was just a small part of it. I just did one episode, but I'm, I'm really happy that I had that opportunity. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Go ahead. Oh, like Spider Baby. Yeah, so I wanted to hear a little bit about that and why you transitioned to that and what was different about it. Um, well, I was excited to do Spider Baby because it was with Lon Chaney Jr. and I had never met him and I was a fan of his. Um, like Boris Karloff was the host on Thriller and I got to meet him. He wasn't in the episode, but he introduced us all in the beginning as we're sitting there and I got to meet him and that was exciting. So then when I you know, had this opportunity, um, to go on an audition for Spider Baby. I don't know if any of you have seen that. I have the DVD out there. It's a very low budget, very low, like $11 or something. No, I don't know. Um, it's a very low uh, budget film, and um, it's very campy, very tongue-in-cheek. And um, I, my brother and sister and I, we kill people. <laughs> and But it's all done in fun. And Lon Chaney Jr. is the um, chauffeur, and, and he's in charge of us, and we have, like, this disease. So my main um, thing about doing that, aside from, you know, I'd never done a role where I kill people. That was kind of interesting. Usually almost every role that I I did, I always had to cry. I don't know. I was always cast as the person who cried but this one um, would be a bit of a challenge and it would be fun and it's uh, as I said it's very campy it's very tongue-in-cheek and Jack Hill he's done a lot of you know the low-budget horror films and he's quite well known in that genre and he's now like in his 80s and he's a very nice man and we <laughs> I'll share this sh the story with you um, last year, I guess it was, we were doing a horror um, convention back east, and there were all these Spider Baby fans there because they you know, they love Jack Hill, all the stuff he does, and um, so they had us on a panel, and um, so afterward they asked us if we would go out to the suite so they could do a, a podcast as well and um, interview us. So. <laughs> We're sitting there, and the moderator turns to Jack, and he goes, Jack, you know, Spider Baby is such, it's become a cult classic, and it's such a campy little bizarre, quirky, kind of out there, strange little film. And he goes, I'm just wondering, like of all the films you've done, what would, you, would possess you to do that? Like, what, how, how would that come about? How would you sit down and write a film like this? And Jack goes, well... I was smoking a lot of weed back then. <laughs> I was like, okay, that explains it. <laughs> it was very funny. Nobody expected him to say that. It was funny. <laughs> it was very funny. Got a question funny. there? Go ahead. I just wanted to say, we just looked up Spider Baby, and it also had 100% on Rotten Wow. Wow. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> well, it's such a crazy little film, but it, it has a following. It's very strange, you know. I mean, um, it. what happened is it was produced by these two men. They were not in the film business. They were attorneys, but they had a big interest in films. So they put up the money, and then it, it was like a $60,000 budget, which is like peanuts. And um, so anyway... Uh, something happened and went into litigation and the film never came out and they had wanted Lon Chaney to do the lead role but he asked for whatever amount it was for his salary and they didn't have it in the budget so he turned it down so they offered it to um, John Carradine well when Lon Chaney heard that John Carradine was interested he said, never mind, I'll do it, because he really wanted to do this film. And he loved, absolutely loved doing 
spider baby. He was so into it. And at the time, you know, it was a well-known fact that he was an alcoholic and he had problems. So it was in his contract that every day he would have to go, you know, out to his trailer and have a little, you know, drink. But it never interfered with work or anything. He had his little drink and then he, he was fine. And he was this really wonderful, sweet, sweet man, very gentle and kind. And there's a scene where he's crying on the porch and in the movie business they have tricks they can get people to cry like if um if they want tears coming down your face they have the makeup people have something it's like glycerin or something that they take with an eyedropper and put it or if they want your eyes to be teary eyed they blow something in your eye for me I, for some reason i've always been overly sensitive and my brother used to say, oh, you cry at supermarket openings, you know. And so I, I always could cry easily, and I never had to do that, fortunately. But they can do that. But if you should watch the movie and you see where he's crying, those were real tears. He absolutely was so into that. And um, Jill Banner, who played the sister, she was a wonderful actress. She was actually dating Marlon Brando. And shortly after that film, it was her first film, and she was wonderful in it, um, she was killed in an automobile accident on Pacific Coast Highway. It was tragic, and Marlon Brando was at her uh, memorial service, and he got up and spoke, and he said that she was one of the only women that he ever really truly loved. But sadly, anyway, so because of this litigation, we did the movie, and then it never came out. It just sat there for years. And then like 40 years later, 50 I guess it was, Quentin Tarantino, who is a friend, and he's bizarre, really nice, but he's out there. And um, he's a friend of Jack Hills, and he saw the film, and he loved it. So somehow, um, through whatever, he got the film to be um, redone and remastered and distributed, and now it's out on DVD and Blu-ray, and it's everywhere so you gotta check it, out. Oh, yeah. it, it's a, it helps if you're drunk when you're watching it. <laughs> it's, like, it's a really bizarre I think I do that. it's a very bizarre film do you have any other questions anybody else no um, we did skip one question um, but I, I like that we brought up the horror movies uh, it, there was one uh, real fun question we have is in a zombie apocalypse what would be your weapon of choice no guns <laughs> Oh, well, any definitely. weapon. Oh, any weapon. Anything. Um, you grab something from the kitchen, from the garage, from the oh, Home Depot down the street? Uh, yeah. uh, I don't know. How about an ice cream cone and just. There you go. Yeah. 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 I'm not, I'm not sure very violent. Work. <laughs> you still have to put it under the sink to warm it up a little. Yeah. <laughs> what do you do with ice cream? <laughs> all right. Anybody else? No? Are we good? Yeah. All right. Well, thank, thank you so much, Beverly Washburn. Thank Washer. you. Awesome. <laughs> thank you. Do you have a table here at the con? Right. Do you have a table here at the con? I do. Yes. All right. Well, let's, yeah. Yeah. I, let's I visit uh, Beverly so, yeah, Washington. Make sure you guys uh, stop by our booth.